Actually, we are going live, ma'am. Good afternoon to everyone. I welcome all the participants for this one day international webinar on urban pest control organized by the PG and Research Department of Advanced Zoology and Biotechnology, Guru Nanak College, Chennai. Now I request our principal, Dr. M.G. Rabunathan, sir, give the welcome address. Good afternoon, one and all. Most respected uh, resource person of the day, Dr. Partho Dunt, senior entomologist, and also our proud alumni of Guru Nanak College, especially Zoology Department, beloved uh, Dean Research, Dr. J. Jayanti, host of this program, Mr. V. Sethul Vairavan, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, my dear colleague, Dr. Shivakumar, and the University of my dear colleague, who are all attending this webinar, and my dear participants and student friends. This is again a proud moment in everyone's Department of Zoology, faculties and students like that the uh, Department of Zoology is organizing wonderful webinars. This is one more feather in the cap of all the faculties and also on the department. Because I can challenge and I can proudly say that none other than any other department, none other than Zoology Department has organized wonderful webinars. Now, just now I was thinking about who has organized this program, rightly pointed out by Mr. Sethil Vairavan that PGM Research Department of Zoology. Happy to hear that. This is what we are all longing for. After a long time, this has come from out of This is the, really a PG and research for full fledged department. And the person who has finished 1988 and well settled in a foreign country, I am proud of you, sir. On behalf of all Gurunana College staff members, management, and my dear students, I extend a hearty welcome to you for this wonderful webinar. Thank and the title is also wonderful. The review of climate change impact on if it has been pest. I would not say anything, but especially I'm very curious to know that the climate change and urban pest. You have that word has given the time during to the lecture. I'm very interested to listen to that. What is urban pest and what is rural pest? A pest is the pest everywhere, but especially nowadays, even human beings have now become a pest. <laughs> In the urban areas, they have become a pest. Torturing neighbors, torturing our poor fellow, the human beings like that. Yeah. And so, topic is wonderful. I'm very happy to participate in this generation. Hope all the students of geology enjoy this, and all the participants will enjoy this because, because of the overwhelming response, we have extended this in UV walls. That is why this is a very, very, yes, a wonderful gala, wonderful gala, and a very wonderful scientific interaction. I congratulate. Dean Research and Mr. Sendil Vairavan for having arranged a wonderful program. And you are the right person, fittest person after a long time. We are waiting for you, person like. And so I am happy in that extending my best wishes and congratulations to all the organizers. A hearty welcome to you, sir. Hearty welcome, sir. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir, for your warm and encouraging words. Now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce and welcome our resource person. Dr. Partho Dang, who has readily accepted our invitation to share his experience on urban pest. Dr. Partho, alumni of Gurunana College, did his BSc in 1988 and PhD in the year 1993. He is an urban entomologist, consultant, author, and an entrepreneur. He has experience for working both private and government institutions in a number of countries in research, development, pesticide registration, and training of practitioners. Dr. Pathodon's research and interest has focused on biorational methods of insect pest management using natural product chemistry, pheromones, microbial pesticides, and insecticides. He is a prolific writer and speaker in the international pest control market and has published over 50 peer-reviewed papers in the international journals of repute, in addition to four books on urban pest management with a prestigious UK-based publishing house. Dr. Pato has developed unique insecticide formulations, which he manufactures in his production plant in the United States and China. He also serves as a panelist and adjudicator for award of the degree of doctorate for a number of universities and has evaluated over 25 doctoral theses. 
He is currently involved in manufacturing pest control products and offers a service as an independent consultant to companies, particularly in Southeast Asia. Now, without further ado, we'll turn the time over to our presenter. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Santil, uh, for this uh, long introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, back to Guru Nanak College, not physically, but at least uh, virtually. But uh, I hope when I travel next time to India, I'll physically present myself uh, to meet you people. So good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon uh, for this opportunity. Good afternoon and thank you for uh, uh, Dr. Raghunathan, the principal of the college, the HOD and staffs of Guru Nanak College, the college department in particular, uh, for this opportunity for me to come and speak uh, in this occasion. I'll quickly move down to my presentation and proper. Senthil, please uh, in, inform me when you see the presentation. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sir. Yes, sir. You can see it now. Clear, isn't it? Yes, sir. It's clear. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about a very important topic. And in fact, it, this is one of the uh, uh, a very contemporary topic, very discussed topic in today's world. I'm going to talk about review of the climate change impact on urban pest. Now, I've divided my presentation into uh, subsections, and I will uh, one by one cover them in my slides. I'll talk briefly about what climate change means in general. I'll also discuss about urbanity. What is urban environment? I'll talk about urban pest. I'll also inform a little bit about climate changes and urban pests. That is my core of my presentation today. And then we'll come out with a conclusion. Well, climate change. Well, climate change is actually a buzzword now. Everywhere we discuss about climate change in environmental seminars, in agriculture seminars, in workshops of food security, geopolitics, anything you talk about, climate change comes in and plays some role. So it becomes a very important buzzword. In fact, if you have Googled, if you go to the Google and ask what are the top 10 words been searched in the internet, apart from McDonald, French fries, you will see climate change also. So climate change has become a very important topic and people search for information on climate change and Google ranks it on the top 10 searched item today in the world. Well, how does climate change look in general? Well, it's a very general topic. So to a common man, what does it mean and how does it look like? Well, if you look at national geography and if you follow uh, programs which comes and aired in national geography, you will see so much information and so much of documentaries been prepared on climate change. I'll just give you a few pictures exactly what climate change means to a general public. This is what we're talking about in the Arctic and Antarctic. The ice is slowly receding. The ice is slowly melting. That's the effect of climate change. There can be something else. Because the ice is melting and ice is slowly moving away from the land, the land is now exposed for agriculture. So Greenland is now booming in agriculture because, it, because the permafrost, the ice has exposed new barren soil for the first time. And farmers are reaping vegetables, growing crops, and they are getting benefited. So it's... It's one, one, one thing is a negative part of the climate change. The other thing is a positive part of the climate change. But what's happening in Bangladesh, for example, because of river erosion and sea erosion, Bangladesh is losing hundreds of square meters of land to sea, to erosion. That's because of climate change. That's because of sea level rise. That's because of harsher typhoons and tornadoes which are coming into the land. There's a country called Kiribati, very near to Hawaii. And a couple of years back, the president of this country, Kiribati, said in a United Nations lecture that I fear Kiribati will, go, will be gone forever. That means what? Because of sea level rise, the entire island nation will vanish in very short time. And they have predicted exactly in how many years this small country of Kiribati will be all gone. Now, people in Kiribati are actually slowly moving away. They're buying lands in other countries because this country will be gone in a few years' time. 
But this is in the Philippines where I live at the moment. Philippines receives possibly about 20 to 25 typhoons or what we call it a cyclone in India every year. 25 cyclones every year. Hit. This is what it looks like. The depart I'm giving a picture of a, a department, of, uh, department of weather. Uh, this is what it is. One after another, the typhoons or, or cyclones, as you call it in India, comes and hit the country of Philippines. And this is what it does. Devastation to a maximum level. And uh, I know now in Chen Chennai, uh, you, are, you are seeing this for the last five years. Previously in Chennai, we, didn't, we had heavy rains, but we never had cyclones to the level what Chennai is watching for the last few years. This is what happened in the Philippines. In five years back, there was a super typhoon hitting the country. And this is what it did to the agriculture. Two million trees were reported damaged in the Philippines by the typhoon, Yolanda. You can see how the damage looks like. Now, what happens when such damage is done by the typhoon? This is what happens because the trees die. Two million trees, coconut trees dying in an, in an area is, is, a, is, a, is a very, very damaging thing for the agriculture. But what happens to the landscape? You look at the landscape. The trees have to be cut down. The trees have to be removed because they are dead trees. So this is what happens to the landscape. They're burning it, they're salvaging the timber, and they are removing as much as possible the wooden material, which is, uh, which is all dotted in the entire landscape. But see, one more, more important thing. Yolanda, the particular typhoon I mentioned here, left over tree stumps served as niches for various wood pests, such as termites and beetles. So for, for people like us who are, in, who are entomologists, who are into pest control, who are in pest management, we saw a very big boom in timber pests. So the entire locality recorded high number of timber pests because of the typhoon. So this is what climate change does. It brings in devastation and the devastation leads to pest boom or pest uh, population growth. So most of the trees were actually cut down and converted into lumber. Again, the more uh, lumbers you produce, more timber you produce, they're more vulnerable to tree pests. So we saw a big boom in, in the population of various timber pests in that particular region where the typhoon really hit. The region continued to see spike in wood pests and report damages. Pests involves were mostly coconut beetle, termites, and various types of wood beetle. So this is how pest is linked to climate change. Though we see climate change in a global way, to entomologists like us who are working in the field, we connect climate change to pest population dynamics in this particular fashion. So this is one of the examples which was studied by me. We have done some research, we have done some work, we have done some data collection to prove how devastations by Typhoons can lead to pest population built up and again damage to buildings and structures. Of course, climate change is a big issue. It has gone up to the United Nations and every year United Nations uh, talks about climate change, discusses about climate change, how to mitigate climate change and what are the actions to be taken in. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, fo it's a subject of the in the forefront. And of course, uh, if you guys, uh, many of you would have seen this movie, The Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore, and you will know exactly in basic terms what climate change can do to earth, to human population, to food security, and all other matters. But today I'm talking about something called review of climate change, the impact of urban pest. Dr. Raghunathan, the principal mentioned exactly, he, he's really intrigued with the word urban pest. He knows pests. But what is this urban pest? That's what he he had uh, 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 raised a question. And I've been working in urban pest since I I, I, uh, I uh, since couple of since many years. Now I have moved uh, to, to work on urban pest. Now pests can be divided in insect pests can be divided into agriculture pests, which we see in crop fields, in croplands, in rice fields, in corn fields, uh, pests attacking various fruit crops. Those are known as agriculture pests. But I'm talking about urban pests, the pests, insect pests, which live and harbor in structures and buildings in cities. Those are categorized as urban pests. It's a, it's a very new field. When I came, when I started uh, 15, 20 years back, people were hardly there in urban pests. Today, we have urban pests 
we have courses of urban pest we teach in college and universities urban pest or urban pest entomology urban entomology as a subject now in many schools and colleges in north america in europe in parts of asia but of course not in india I haven't seen a coursework in urban entomology yet maybe in the future we might be able to do that now uh, cabi cabi is a very important uh, uh, publisher uh, of uh, academic books based in the uk and london and a few years back they came out uh, to uh, to make come out with a publication as a caps they call it as a cabi climate change series and they invited me to write a book and edit a book on climate change impacts and urban pests so it was quite challenging work for me it took me about 2 to 3 years of research and reading to come out with this particular book it's a series of books 1 to 10 which discusses effect of climate change into various aspects like crop in agriculture in sanitation irrigation and i was the one who edited uh, the 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 last of the series uh, in this entire fold the effect of climate change on urban pest now in this research while working on this book i have gathered enormous amount of evidence examples that distributions density behavior patterns of pests are changing because of climate change we also reported that new pest occurrence pests which were not seen before in a particular territory are now seen because of climate change so these were some of the new findings which are all uh, uh, been researched and developed in this uh, book if people are interested to study further or do research on this this book can be a very handy resource for them now i mentioned something about uh, human beings of course everybody knows what human beings are how what is a species but what is urbanity now th th that's a very intriguing questions what is urbanity urbanity means urban environment the way it is developing okay that is urban environment so i'm trying to link human species with urban development and climate change and that is what my uh, my interest of the talk as well as my book is also uh, all about see the facts below which uh, which are quite in interesting to note down over 50% of human population today resides in cities that means 50% of 7.2 billion person actually live in cities or urban areas we call them as urban areas out of 50 out of this urban population cities occupy 1% only 1% of global land mass imagine 50% of the people are squeezed into 1% of global land mass that means we are concentrated so human human beings are now concentrated living in very small spots called cities so so 50% of the population are now locked in a very small geographical areas note one thing the very important factor the third point most cities are located near seas and rivers these are most vulnerable areas when it comes to climate changes so now i'm trying to link human beings their lives in cities cities are very near coastal areas sea or a river and climate change effects are most effective in these coastal areas than inland areas inland cities so all of these are now very well linked up to study uh, uh, becomes a, a, a major uh, uh, area of thought and research now they are predicting in another 10 to 15 years another 20% of human population from rural area will move into cities and make the cities more packed even more packed packed so cities are growing in that way obviously this is something of a very big concern now you might be thinking exactly how an entomologist is talking about all these things how it's linked up so this is what i am going to slowly come and develop this my presentation is all about see urbanity or urban environment present concentrated human population you already understand now 1% of the global pop, uh, sorry 50% of the global population now live in 1% of land mass so how concentrated population is when you have so many people living in a small area like the city picture of a city which i'm showing you here what happens it accumulates resources such as food and water how much food and water is available for an insect to search for a food in an agriculture land he has to fly or she has to fly look for the real ripening fruit locate it and then eat it and survive on that but if you come to a city food is everywhere so why not the pest come to a city and live that's what's happening 
there is invasion of newer species taking place from all surrounding areas into cities. We have done lots of survey where we have found in the city, we have biodiversity of insects have grown tremendously in the last few years because of concentrated accumulated resource of food and water. Cities provide all of them, whereas an agriculture field may provide them, but it will be distributed or scattered in a very long area. City provides that in a very accumulated form. City also provides various niches. If you go to an agriculture field, you will have a plant and the soil. These are the only two niches available. Whereas in a city, there are thousands of micro habitats. There, is an, there are supermarkets, there are parks, there are buildings of different sizes, there are tunnels, there are roadways, there are crops plants, there are urban agricultures on rooftops. So these are thousands of niches in a one square kilometers you will find. And more the niches, more chances for insects to live and survive. So obviously we are noticing that this is the reason because of this microclimate, microhabitats created by human inside in the cities, many and many insects, many other uh, vertebrate pests are slowly moving in and now they're found in cities more than in other rural areas. So this is one of the reasons why the subject of urban entomology is becoming very, very important now in this modern world. Of course, the reason can be because of disease. Now today we are talking about zoonotic diseases. Disease is transferred from animals to humans through, through a vector or a non-vector. So all of this is all because of an urban living. It's easy to spread these diseases in a very small time because of concentration of people and resources. So this is how urban entomology is getting linked into city and climate change. We also have diversity of flora and fauna. In, for example, in the Philippines, in, 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 if you go to a, a, a if you go to an expensive five star hotel, if you go to the lawn and walk around the park around the hotel, you will find twenty five species of trees and plants which are not belong to Philippines, but they have been imported from other countries, from Europe, from Australia, for landscape, for beautification. Now this 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 flora and this flora which are not originally from the country is actually attracting new type of pests. They also bring new type of pests. So, so, so this is another reason why urban pests are very getting very diverse because we're importing plants for beautification, for designing landscapes and things like that. So obviously this is a challenge for urban entomologists. Of course, there is climate control. We are living in air conditioning situation. Pests which love to stay, for example, pests which loves to stay in, in an air conditioning situation will love to stay with a human being because he controls the environment. German cockroach is one example. German cockroach cannot tolerate high, extreme high temperature, extreme low temperature. That's why you see always German cockroaches living with human beings. Wherever there are human beings, there are German cockroaches because they have adapted to this 10 degree fluctuation of temperature as the best for them. So wherever human being goes, they put on their air conditioning and the German cockroach love to stay with them. So that's how they move always with human beings. You don't find them in, 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 in rural areas because the temperature fluctuations in rural areas are high because we don't use air conditioning in rural areas. People live uh, without air conditioning. So climate control is also there in, in cities and many pests love to stay with uh, this climate control. There's something else also in the city which is very important called heat islands. Cities, cities like a like a city center, like the, uh, the picture I'm showing you here, can 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 have higher heat, much higher heat than the surrounding areas. The heat can go up to 12 degrees more than the surrounding areas. Now this extreme heat can also help certain pests, certain organisms to thrive very well in city centers. These are known as heat islands. For example, this is the example. Urbanization causes regional increase in temperature that exceed those measured on a global scale, which are as much as 12, 12 degrees centigrade warmer than the surrounding areas. So the city centers can be almost 12 degrees higher in heat than the surrounding areas. And many pests love this heat and they adapt to this heat better than other pest species and they thrive in, this, in these areas. 
So they become a pest to these people who are living in these particular heat islands or the city centers. It is obvious animals and plants living in urban area will differentially respond to altered conditions in comparison to natural world. So it's obvious. The same species which is living in the rural area will respond differently than the species which is living in these heat islands at an extreme heat. Now I can exact, exactly, I can uh, give you uh, an example here, how heat or how the urban heat islands uses or affects the population of the pest. You read this one. This makes an urban area to amplify both abiotic and biotic parameters often favoring the pest life history. And I have lots of example where pests can multiply faster in a city than in a rural area simply because you provide the cities provide a conducive environment, a warm environment than the rural areas. In the absence of natural enemies, see another reason, cities do not have natural enemies. Whereas in agriculture, agriculture field, a lepidopteran pest will have its natural enemies. If you go to a rice field, there are biological control agents. But in the city, when a pest moves into a city, he doesn't have natural enemies. So the only thing is he can thrive very well. So there is no control of population. Like, for example, German cockroaches or cockroaches, they do not have natural enemies. Whereas a pest in the agriculture field has a natural enemy. So that controls the population of the agriculture pest. But a cockroach in a, in a city center, there's no natural enemy except a human being who goes for pest control. So, so, the, so these pests have a chance, the urban pests have got a chance to really uh, uh, increase their population to disproportionate sizes and obviously affect uh, population studies. Urban heat islands and insect physiology. This is also very important. People who are interested in or working in physiology or doing research in uh, physiology will understand that certain insects uh, who have come into urban areas, they have adapted to this higher heat and they can control the heat without even changing their philosophy uh, in their uh, physiology of uh, uh, internal physiology. That means they have adapted highly into this environment and they, that, that these particular species have become truly urban uh, in definition. For example, example of I'm giving you here is a leaf cutter ant, which has been shown that it can tolerate higher heat in the city at no cost. That means it has adapted itself physiologically without any cost. Now, climate change impact on urban pests has been really well reviewed. It's a very hot topic. It, only in the last 15 years, people have started taking interest into that. I, I did a, a, a comprehensive review in 2016. United, uh, United States, the EPA, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, did it in 2010. CIH is a, is a body in UK in 2008. There are other reviews available on the whole subject, which uh, researchers can take on to study more. Now, when you talk about uh, uh, global temperature rise, we talk about two degrees rise, isn't it? That is that is generally known as climate change. People are looking at that two degree rise, that how many years time the temperature, global temperature will go by two degrees by uh, in, in another, possibly another uh, 80 years time, we might possibly hit that two degrees rise of our uh, global climate. Now, temperature is very important when it comes to insects because insects are cold-blooded organisms and they cannot regulate their body temperature. The temperature of their body is approximately the same as that of their immediate environment. So that is that is very basic physiology. Everybody of us knows that. Temperature is probably a single most important environmental factor influencing insect behavior, distribution, development, survival, and reproduction. So that has been proven. I mean, any anybody with the basic entomology can understand that you change the temperature by two degrees, that, and, and, and you can see difference in biology, the number of eggs laying, the number of the hatching rate, the, the life cycle duration, everything changes with two to three degrees temperature. And any, any basic biologist will understand that. So it has been estimated that with two degrees temperature increase, insect might experience one to five additional life cycle per season. So that is the rate. In two degrees change can, can add on five more life cycles in the same duration. So you can imagine how a population can burst in two degrees rise in temperature. I, of course, the uh, uh, basic biology, this is the temperature, the idle temperature for insect uh, reproduction is around 30 to 32 degrees centigrade. That's the idle one. 
if you if you if you go over that temperature to higher temperature again you can control the temper uh, insects if you lower the temperature again up to 10 10 degrees or up to 4 degrees you can again uh, 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 freeze the insects and you can stop their developmental rate right away so temperature is a very important factor in insect breeding insect reproduction insect distribution and when you talk about climate change temperature becomes a very important character so this is how we link the temperature rise globally as, a, as due to climate change and insect development, growth, population dynamics, and things like that. That's how we link it up. Now, there was an interesting study done in UK by Roy et al. And uh, this lady actually uh, published a paper which, which she did, did an extensive work on, on laboratory work as well as field work and said, if the climate changes in on the earth, over the next few years, what will, what are the insects which will be not affected? She said German cockroaches population in the cities will not be affected. Bed bugs will not be affected. Ants, sudden woodworms, cat fleas, beetles, cloth moth, European hornets, for example. She cited these examples are, these are pests, but their population will not be affected. Now, you, you exactly might know exactly why climate change will not affect them because German cockroaches, for example, they're indoor. We they live in a controlled environment. Human, whenever the time temperature goes out in the environment, human will cool their air conditioning. So they will bring the temperature to the idle condition. A German cockroaches live indoor. So obviously the effect of temperature on German cockroaches or bed bugs, for example, they are also indoor pests. Pharaoh ants also are basically they are structural pests. They 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 make a large. Uh, colonies on structures and buildings. So similarly, these insects will not be affected by increase in climate change. But what are the insects which could be possibly be affected? Look at them. Some of the species of ant species, termite species, housefly, urban mosquitoes like Culex mosquitoes. Uh, there are wetland mosquitoes of AD species, moth flies, garden ant species. So she came out with a list of insects, urban insects, which could be possibly been affected by urban pests. So similar lists can be prepared in different geography and different places. This is United, uh, I'm talking about United Kingdom, work done in United Kingdom. We do not have such list done on tropical countries uh, yet, but this is more of a temperate thing. So you can understand exactly how urban pest and climate change are related. One, the first slide was about the pests which should not be affected. And this actually describes a few pests which could be affected. Obviously, the reasons are most of them are outdoor. For example, termites, they live outdoor in the soil. So, so definitely climate change or temperature increase or precipitation will affect because they are outdoor pests. The study also uh, high, uh, further predicted that the 10 species most likely to increase with change in precipitation patterns are the same as those increasing temperature with the exception of Musca domestica and Flavotomus sand fly population. So, so precipitation and temperature are two different characteristics. We can work in tandem, they can work together and also can work separately on urban pest populations. Now, urban pests and exposure to climate, the effect of climate change is however complex and will be determined by an extent of pest actual exposure to it. This is what uh, I mentioned to you. A bed bug lives inside the inside the room, inside hidden in a mattress. So obviously the exposure of this pest to climate change is minimal. So obviously bed bug will not be affected. The population of bed bug or distribution of bed bug will not be much affected. These species which live in tandem with human beings are known as Synanthropic species such as bed bugs and human parasite species such as head lice are unlikely to experience a major change in population dynamics. Obviously, the reasons are uh, 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 now clear to you why climate change will not be affected. This type of species which are living very close with human beings. But the most important effect of climate change on insect pests, particularly urban insect pests, is on mosquitoes and, and a lot of work has been going on with mosquitoes. Obviously, the reasons are mosquitoes are vectors. They are transmitted to uh, a number of diseases uh, from uh, human to human, from animal to human. So obviously, most of the research which has been done on climate change and insects have gone into mosquitoes. And these are some of the some of the things which I'm going to uh, discuss in the next few slides quickly. Now, mosquitoes have drawn most attention when it comes to predicting climate change for both health and economic reasons. Obviously, mosquitoes are highly responsive to climate change. Changes in climate change and increased temperature is associated with increased abundance, assuming there are sufficient number of water-filled sites as in the habitat. Now, this is an interesting study which was done by Kuehler in 
2015 in she did uh, work in arctic region arctic regions you always find the temperature to be coolish and the effect of climate change in arctic and antarctics are more visible more clearer than on tropics which are always recording higher temperature so research work done on mosquitoes in arctic actually is 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 a very conclusive work and she did some work where she showed something like which i'm going to share here she showed she worked on species called aedes nigripus and showed conclusively showed that warmer spring temperatures cause the mosquitoes to emerge two weeks earlier and shorten the development time through the larvan pupil stages by about 10 percent for every one degree rise in temperature so every one degree rise in temperature you're halfening the speed of uh, uh, in the life cycle so exactly it shows the population of these particular mosquitoes can really grow to big levels if we really get the two degrees rise in temperature which they are predicting uh, for global uh, globally so same study shows that with a two degree warming scenario the model predicted that the mosquitoes population will increase by 53 percent that means two degree rise will lead to 53 percent population rises so this is how Again, it shows how climate change and urban pest and public pest like mosquito can be really connected very well. Climate change with mosquitoes and flooding. See, this is this is one of the uh, in-house uh, research done in Vector Control Research Institute in Pondicherry. They found that breeding population of anopheles in the tsunami waters inundated habitats. That was something which is very unique. You see the results at the below. When the tsunami came in, the seawater is, sea is a saline water and it came and flooded most of the crop fields around southern part of India. But they found evidence of Culex breeding very well in this saline water up to 2,541 to 17,468 ppm level. So salinity of water has been increased many times, but you can see a population of Culex thriving there. So when sea climate changes, the sea level rises, there's flooding, extensive flooding going on. You might think the mosquito populations will go down because the water has changed into saline water. The canal water has become saline now. No, there are species of insect pests, particularly mosquitoes here, which can adapt to salinity, even salinity, and thrive very well. So climate change can bring all these type of changes in the adaptation of insects, and we can have a totally confusing scenario presented in front of us. See this one, low laying paddy fields and fallow lands with salinity ranging to 3,000 to 42,505 ppm were also found to support hybriding populations of anopheles species. This is a VCRC report in 2005, right after tsunami. So climate change, sea level rise, flooding of in inundation of low lying areas, still we have a population of mosquitoes which are thriving very well. So, so it, it, it is something which we need to consider that, yes, mosquitoes can breed and thrive there. But the most important thing about mosquito and climate change is the distribution. Like, like for example, the dengue causing uh, and dengue, chikungunya and other zoonotic causing pests, the Aedes aegypti. Once limited by temperature. Actually, why Aedes aegypti was not seen in hill stations, higher elevation? Because it was because of temperature. Previously, Aedes aegypti is never seen over 1,000 meter elevation in cities which are over 1,000 meter. But now, Aedes aegypti is found at 1,700 meter in Mexico City and other cities in southern, uh, southern uh, America. What, what is the reason? Why Aedes aegypti, which was restricted to 1,000 meter, has now seen in 1,700 meters, up to 2,000 meters? Why? The reason is heat. The climate change, these hill stations or hill cities have started warming. And availability of water, precipitation, these mosquitoes are now slowly migrating on top of this hill station. So this is a very, very uh, good evidence that climate change is happening. And insect pests, particularly the urban pests, are utilizing this climate change to venture into territories which were not there before. So they are moving into those new territories. Mosquito and its link to climate changes has recently under close scrutiny 
with the increased incidence of malaria in the highland urban areas such as in nairobi nairobi is also a hill station it is is over over certain 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 meters over the sea but now we see incidence of malaria in nairobi in a hill, hilly area why how can it happen because anopheles is moving into nairobi city why it is able to how is able to move to nairobi city on higher elevation simply because of warming up climate change this is the distribution pattern of mosquitoes previously aedes albopictus was restricted to in the tropic region only but see over the last few years it has moved more into the temperate region previously aedes aegypti was only near the tropics a single small thin belt across the tropics but see the as climate changes climate warms up the distribution patterns also changes now it is now seen up to america even up to canada and down to melbourne in australia and southern part of latin america also in the cooler parts what is the reason for this distribution changes is simply because the earth is warming up so this insect is now able to move to new geographical areas creating new diseases spreading new diseases as a vector and of course proving challenges to urban entomologists like us who have to work uh, to survey to control and give management practices climate change is affecting not only mosquitoes in distribution in population in in in, in other related things but also pests like flies ticks rodents snails and termites are also being affected by that climate change they are uh, um, building larger populations they are more frequent now their uh, their breeding cycles have increased previously possibly this pests were actually having one or two cycles a year or three cycles a year now it has become five cycles a year so obviously there's a bust of population uh, 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 in them now for example see this particular uh, slide i'm talking about termite distribution termites are again a tropical pest they are wood pest they live in the term, in the tropic region but now see how they have expanded into temperate areas now termites are found in canada in cold place in canada in germany they have detected termite in italy these countries have never before have seen termite in buildings and structures in the cities now reports are coming from all of these european countries that they are seeing termites there so so what is the reason what is the cause for termites to move so much upward into those territories or downward into tasmania in new caledonia which are all cooler places simply because the earth is warming climate change is taking place obviously the termite populations are also expanded into this area i just uh, uh, this is what the same thing i just want to show you just repeat the same thing what i said here see so reports of tropical species such as coptotermis this is a species of termite which is a subterranean termite becoming established in subtropics Uh, this has been already been researched very well and if you read these papers you will really see how exactly the termites are moving in their distribution into temperate region from the tropics uh, uh, areas in cold areas in north america such as in wisconsin and southern canada population of reticulate termites this is a species of termite a subterranean termite which is appears to be gradually expanding the range and even swarming under natural outdoor conditions this was not seen before so this is what it shows that termite populations is also expanding into temperate and cooler areas simply because of that a ciech report chartered institute of environmental health that is a government body which is uk based body which actually comes out with annual reports on various environmental parameters have concluded in 2008 suggested that climate change will favor pest population all pest population particularly urban pest population which i am talking here these include flies mosquitoes rodents and other pests so just to conclude what i've been talking about in this very short uh, talk this particular talk was actually meant for 2 hours where i delivered it during a, a convention but i have just cut it down let let's conclude now climate change is predicted to bring change of events in life of an organism and pest for example growth and development will definitely have a change maybe on the positive side survivorship will change they will survive more because there is no bad weather there is warm weather so they will survive more population dynamics will go for 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 changes which will, we will get large populations of these pest in in areas where the climates are favorable behaviors and adaptations changes will take place there will be migration lots of migration we we are doing our research work now we are talking about invasive species this particular pests were actually known to be forest and agriculture pests before 
but now we are frequently finding them from cities so because there's a large scale migration taking place because these insects have found cities to be a better place to stay than in the forest and now how homeowners are complaining that they have particular type of insects in their houses when we go for a survey we find these are agriculture pests why they are inside a house we do not know that these are known as this is known as a migration and we call them as invasive species and there is lots of work going on on this particular subject now of course the global distribution of pests is going for a change because of climate changes destruction of habitats creation of new habitats and things like that climate change will also determine efficacy of insecticide if the temperature becomes warmer many of the insecticide will not work so what you are spraying now may not work because it is warmer and insecticides are not stable at higher temperature you know that so obviously this is a totally new challenge for pest control or pest management in the area of pest management efficacy of insecticide incorporated products will also have a problem we have insecticides incorporated in paints in wallpapers in 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 wooden wooden uh, uh, items wooden items they incorporate insecticide with the paint in, inside the wood they incorporate them and have the finished product so if the temperature rises what will happen the insecticide will break down so obviously you will not have the effect the same effect so efficacy of pest control jobs will suffer obviously so you have to entirely review your pest management schemes because of uh, totally new changes in temperature the this is the final slide the future of environment is certain to be different and the pest management industry should not overlook this as an important fact so obviously the pest control industry pest management industry has to consider the future of their industry depends upon how much changes in the conversion can take place so thank you very much for your patience listening hopefully you had an interesting discussion we can have and have take some few questions thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you very much sir for sharing your extensive experience and knowledge with us thank you sir and uh, i think the participants have, have asked lot of questions so i would like to read out uh, for you sir it will be displayed on the screen also okay yeah sesha has asked today the health minister of kerala has announced that a new genus of malaria has been detected in kannur what's your view on this well uh, i i mentioned very very uh, in a very short uh, way that there are going to be new diseases coming in simply because of uh, changes happening in the environment maybe this this particular uh, disease is it called malaria yeah it's a malaria so is this particular protozoan was possibly not known to human population it was possibly in the in the periphery in the rural areas for example or some areas were in the forest but when the vector comes in because of temperature changes new species coming in human comes in contact with this particular vectors so obviously new type of zoonotic diseases animal human diseases are supposed to come in and in the next few years we are going to possibly see new and new zoonotic diseases coming in to that environment and this is nothing new this is going to happen and we have to be really be cautious about it here yes. okay and next question is from uh, kp ashwin kumar some ants swarming in my house get inside water bottles yeah. any utensil filled with water and kill themselves knowingly or unknowingly is this weird behavior due to not uh, uh, actually uh, insects are always uh, attracted to large water bodies uh, if you remember if you're a student of entomology or you have done some basic observations we sometimes use water traps for insects you you keep a big large basin of water and you put a source of light or anything else you can see insects can be trapped but this sort of weird behavior now that can be because of the warmth or heat or seeking moisture there can be any ecological reasons why the insect is attracted to a large water body um, well we, it all depends upon exactly what about species in particular we are talking about here what's the need for those insects to come in to the water uh, you are just generally mentioning it is uh ants some ants so possibly uh, ecologically these ants might require a moisture source and they might be just be attracted to the water but i don't think there's this, it's not a weird behavior is definitely there's a reason behind this ecological behavior of why they're attracted to the water okay next question is again from shesha panindra sharma 
what are some of the natural measures to control the pest population in urban areas that can be employed using products readily available at households well uh, if you if you really look into the web uh, in the in, in google there are thousands of uh, plant based product essential oils and spices and claims of uh, lots of things which can be used uh, plants certain plants can repel uh, mosquitoes for example so they put the plants in the house there are many things which are available but i said none works for over the last 20 years i've been working in the field believe me you have to resort to judicious use of insecticides of course the best way is to prevent is to have barriers physical barriers keeping them away from the house and structures that is possibly is the most recommended but when it cannot be done obviously resort to chemical insecticide is the best uh, uh, way i can say but provided you know exactly you are using a professional person you are using the right amount of dosage you are using the label directions which are still prescribed under the under the prescription of the label and stuff like that so professionally i don't see natural pest control work in an urban area as much as a chemical or synthetic one will so obviously that is my recommendation that you you definitely have to resort to uh, chemicals as as a safe climb thank you sir and uh, one more question from priyanka sir if you can totally wipe out the entire population of a particular pest to their absence will cause any impact on environment good or bad it may be yeah definitely uh, uh, every 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 insect every insect has a role to play uh, uh, removing a particular insect from from the entire world for example if you remove termites totally i i say i, I have to remove termites because termites are causing problem to household buildings and structures obviously it will have serious repercussion on on uh, on uh, decomposition of forest wood for example so everybody everything every insect has a role to play but as a pest controller or a pest management we we are just looking at the economic level we are just keeping them in a check at the economic level we do not want our clients to be harmed but we don't kill we don't wipe out the population we control and manage it to a economic acceptable level so that is the work of a pest manager or the pest management person <laughs> but we are not here to wipe out the population ecologically from them thank you ajish prakash has asked how can we prevent from harmful insects without affecting the beneficial insect also what is your views on gene silencing helping in controlling pests yes 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 these are new technology gene silencing uh, genetic engineering biotechnology are coming up very well particularly in mosquito control there are certain genes which have been identified in mosquitoes they are inserting those genes in the male mosquito so the male mosquito will carry the gene multiply with the female mosquito and make the eggs uh, uh un unfertile something like that so this technology is uh, coming up uh, particularly in mosquito control genetic engineering and biotechnology is coming up in mosquito control now they they are uh, breeding special type of genetically engineered modified insects population and releasing them in the field so that automatically the population can be controlled by a particular gene which will work in the female body so that it goes to the egg destroys the egg prevents the egg from hatching and stuff like that so yes that's a new frontier in uh, pest control is uh, working in uh, genetic engineering gene silencing or activating certain gene or inserting a new gene uh, uh, these are futures and there are na nanotechnologies coming in nanotechnologies are coming in into also in the pest management yes. thank you so one last question we take sir from uh, professor janaki raman so what will you suggest to control migratory grasshopper in agriculture fields yeah when i saw those pictures of uh, locals all over all over northern india i was just thinking i wish i was in india because we were talking about uh, how to control them see i i think uh, this migratory grasshopper process is a, is an ancient thing it has been going on since a long time yes climate change um, has affected the stream of wind the air flow has helped them to come deep inside india nothing can be done to stop them but we can always talk about monitor them predict them through various climate change model by uh, doing suitable modeling exactly can we predict one month ahead what's going to happen so what is going on not in killing the grasshopper 
whatever the latest work is going on in the migratory grasshopper is not about killing the grasshopper or wiping the population off. We are talking about more of satellite monitoring, advance warnings, repelling them. So the work is only going on in this direction. We are not talking about removing this population. So, so control will come by by awareness, the awareness, more on awareness, more of alert, more of uh, repelling. Repelling the population, growing some sort of a trap crops. That they are trapped in a in a cheap crop, whereas the expensive expensive crop is protected. So lots of cultural things are also being studied now. Nobody in the agriculture department at the moment or scientists in any of the top laboratories are talking about helping out the migratory grasshopper population. So work is going on only in this type of regions. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, sir, for sharing all your experience uh, in the field of urban pest management. Thank you. Now, uh, I request uh, Dr. J. Shivkumar to propose the vote of thanks. So, good afternoon to our uh, most valued guests, professors from various institutions, management committee, and the most beloved children. It is my privilege to have been asked uh, to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. I, on behalf of uh, Gurunana College, I extend a very hearty vote of thanks to the chief guest, Dr. Patudan, sir, to start the time from his busy uh, schedule to grace the occasion. I thank our principal sir, vice principals, general secretary, HOD and the dean research Dr. J. Jayanti Madam for the tireless effort to conduct this international webinar. Thanks to Mr. Sandy Vairavan, assistant professor, department of zoology for introducing chief guest and hosting this webinar. Here, we are fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very dedicated and motivated team of our department who know their tasks and are very much result oriented. Thank to all the people who have directly or indirectly helped to make the event a grand success. Thanks to, the, to those who attended this international webinar. Thank you for being with us. Once again, I thank you one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.